Welcome to CPL Basics. If you're watching this video, that means you probably either are thinking about applying for or already have your CPL or concealed pistol license for Washington State. If you are going to have a CPL, it's important that you understand some of the basics of firearm safety, handling, and legalities. So we're going to start by talking about firearm safety. It's imperative that you understand that if you're going to carry a firearm for self-defense, you are responsible for that firearm. Nobody else can take responsibility. Anything that happens, good or bad, you're responsible. So it's very important that you take full responsibility for your actions with a firearm. And with that, one of the things that we always want to remember when it comes to firearm safety is that we never want to handle a firearm while we're under the influence of alcohol and or drugs. Now a lot of people say, oh, no problem. I would never shoot my gun while I was drinking alcoholic beverages. Well, that's great. But notice it says never handle a firearm while under the influence of alcohol and or drugs. That means that if you're sitting at home and you're having a couple drinks, that's probably not a good time to pull out your firearm and check it out and play around a little bit or maybe go, hey, I'm just sitting around doing nothing anyway after a couple drinks. How about I clean my firearm? No, that's a bad idea. Don't handle a firearm when you're under the influence of alcohol and or drugs. The second part of that is drugs. And people go a lot of times, if I filled out my CPL application, I already put on there that I don't do drugs. I, I don't do drugs, so that's not an issue. Great! But again, this isn't just talking about street drugs. This is also talking about prescription drugs. Let's say you have a surgery or you've been having some back pain. You go to the doctor, they give you a little prescription, and on the bottle it says, uh, warning, may cause drowsiness, or do not operate heavy machinery. So that means you should not handle your firearm while you're under the influence of that medication as well. Next, we're going to talk about the universal firearm safety rules. There are four universal firearm safety rules to remember. What are they? These rules are universal rules because they apply to every firearm, in every situation, with every application. So it's important that you'll notice you go to any shooting range that they all have these four universal firearm safety rules listed somewhere. Some of them are worded the same, some are worded slightly different, but they all have the same basic intent behind the same four rules. So we're going to talk about what those are now. Rule number one, you want to treat all firearms as if they are loaded. Rule number two, Never point a gun at anything you are not willing to shoot or destroy. Number three, keep your finger off the trigger until you're ready to shoot. And number four, be aware of your target, backstop, and beyond. These four universal firearm safety rules are taught at every training and they're taught to everybody that takes professional instruction on firearms, whether that's civilians, law enforcement, or military. But what we find when we ask people, hey, what are the four universal firearm safety rules? Most people go, oh, um, let's see. And they'll try to name them, and maybe they get two, maybe three of them. So here at Safe Insight, we copyrighted the SAFE rules. And what the SAFE rules are is an acronym to help you remember the four universal firearm safety rules using the acronym SAFE. So what does SAFE stand for? S. Suppose all firearms are loaded. A. Aim firearms in a safe direction at all times. F. Finger off the trigger until you are ready for a bullet to come out and E, everything in the path of the bullet has to be accounted for. Here at Safe Insight, we copyrighted the acronym SAFE to help you remember the four universal firearm safety rules. I'm going to use this CERT pistol to demonstrate each of these rules as we talk about it in detail. So the CERT pistol is a really great training tool if you've never seen one. What it is is it's got a, a hardened plastic magazine. There's no way for a bullet to get in or out. There is no way to get a bullet in or out of the chamber because the slide does not move. 
And finally, there's no opening at the muzzle area of the firearm, meaning that the only thing that comes out when you press the trigger is a laser. So it's a very great training tool to help demonstrate marksmanship skills, but it also works well to demonstrate safety skills. So let's talk about the safe rules and what they mean. So S stands for suppose all guns are always loaded. So we want to suppose that every firearm we pick up is loaded. Now obviously I know beyond a shadow of a doubt this firearm is not loaded, but it looks like, it's shaped like, and it feels like a firearm. So I'm going to treat it as though it's loaded. I'm not going to let my mind get lazy and go, oh yeah, but that's just a training gun, so I can twiddle that around on my finger, or I can wave that around at people. No. It looks like a firearm, so I suppose that it is loaded. Next is A. I want to aim the firearm in a safe direction at all times. What's a safe direction? Well, a lot of people say, well, if I'm at a range, down range. That's a safe direction. Absolutely. If you're at a range, it's got areas that are built to catch bullets, right? So down range is a safe direction at a range. But what about when you're not at a range? Well, I'm not at a range right now. So what I'm doing is I'm pointing down at the ground. So does that mean that pointing down is a safe direction? Maybe. Depends on where you're at. In my particular location, it is a safe direction. But if I were on the third floor of, say, an apartment building, is down a safe direction? Absolutely not. There's people below me, right? So wherever you're at, you have to constantly evaluate what is a safe direction and make sure that you're aimed in a safe direction at all times. Next is F. Finger off the trigger until you're ready for a bullet to come out. This is a little distinction from the original rule we talked about that a lot of times says keep your finger off the trigger until you're ready to shoot. Let's talk about why we make that distinction. Have you been to an indoor range before? If you have, I promise you've seen on the floor little skip marks from bullets hitting the ground, right? You know how that happens? Even the best trained person that does really good work at keeping their finger off the trigger, they go, okay, I'm ready to shoot, finger on the trigger, bang! on their way up to the target. Uh-oh, that's a problem, right? So we say finger off the trigger until you're ready for a bullet to come out. Because if I'm up here, am I ready for a bullet to come out right now? Absolutely not. I'm not ready for a bullet to come out until I'm pointed at my target. Now I can put my finger on and do my pressing. And before I ever come down off the target, my finger comes off the trigger. That includes shooting and looking at your target to see where you shot. A lot of people cheat this and they go bang bang hey where'd it go? My fingers on the trigger. Should it be? Absolutely not. Because if I'm looking at my target am I ready for a bullet to come out? No way. So it should be shoot your shots, finger off the trigger, now pull the gun down and see where you shot. And in our marksmanship course we explain how this actually helps your marksmanship too, but that's something for a later time. So you want to keep your finger off the trigger until you're ready for a bullet to come out. What does it mean to keep your finger off the trigger? Well, when we say finger off the trigger, is my finger off the trigger right now? Well, technically, I mean it's not technically touching the trigger, but how easy is it for my finger to slip off of the trigger guard and onto the trigger? Way too easy. So what we mean when we say finger off the trigger is to index your trigger finger along the frame of the firearm. You want to index along the frame of the firearm. And if you'll notice, a lot of modern firearms have a little notch on the frame there for your fingertip to rest in nicely to let you know you've got it where it belongs in a safe position. Now why do we want to index our finger up here? Well, two reasons. Number one is we talked about down here, very easy to slip on, right? Up here, not so easy to slip on the trigger. It actually takes a conscious movement to the trigger. Number two is if we're at a range together and I'm shooting next to you and I take my shots, bang, bang, and I come down like this, real easy for you to tell that my finger's off the trigger? Not so much, right? But if I'm shooting next to you, bang, 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 and I do this, 
Is it pretty easy to tell that my finger's off the trigger? Absolutely. So it gives you confidence that I'm being safe. In addition, it keeps my finger secured off the trigger. So remember, finger off the trigger till you're ready for a bullet to come out. And when we say finger off the trigger, it means indexed on the frame of the firearm. Next is E. Everything in the path of the bullet has to be accounted for. So that means you want to be aware of not just what you're shooting at, your target, but what your backstop is, what's going to stop the bullet. And also, beyond that, just in case you miss your target and your backstop. It's not uncommon to see people out shooting in the woods or at some outdoor area and you see them maybe shooting some pumpkins. And you say, hey, uh, what are you shooting at down there? I say, oh, I'm shooting those pumpkins. And you go, oh, hey, what's going to stop the bullet? Uh, <laughs> those pumpkins. Uh, no. Bullets typically travel through things, not into them. So very important that you understand that bullets are going to travel through things until something brings them to a stop, something significant, something like brick, heavy mounds of dirt, steel, something significant has to stop that bullet. So you need to be aware of everything in the path of the bullet. In fact, do you know how far the average handgun round can travel if it's not impeded by something? A lot of people are shocked to find out that the average handgun round can actually travel about a mile if it's not impeded by anything. Well, you think about a lot of the densely populated areas that we're in, and if a bullet traveled a mile, how many things would be in between that mile and you for that bullet to touch? A lot. And guess what else? Attached to every one of those things, a friendly attorney with a smile on his face waiting to get paid from you because your bullet touched the object that he's attached to. So make sure when you press the trigger, everything in the path of that bullet is accounted for. Now that we've talked about how to safely handle and operate firearms, let's talk about how we safely store firearms. Now if you ask anybody out there, hey, what's the best way to store a firearm? You're going to get a multitude of answers. And it's not that they're all wrong, it's that they have different reasonings behind them. So let's talk about the goals of secure firearm storage to help us determine what the best storage solution is. There are four specific goals to firearm storage. The first one is to keep firearms out of the hands of children. This is a no-brainer. Obviously, we don't want children to have access to firearms because we don't want to see the tragedy that comes with it. We don't want the legal responsibilities that come with it. So we want to make sure that our firearms are secured from children. Next, we want to ensure that they're secure from untrained adults, otherwise known as grown children. <laughs> You've all got those friends, I'm sure, one or two of them that you know you wouldn't trust them alone in your house because what would they do? They'd have to touch everything that they came across. They'd flip every light switch, press every button. They'd probably get themselves hurt with a blender because they wouldn't read the directions on how to operate it, right? So we want to keep the firearms out of the hands of untrained adults. Next, we want to make theft of the firearm as difficult as possible. That means we want to make it so that if somebody wants that firearm, they're going to have to work for it. They can't just come in our house and go, hey, look at that gun sitting there on the table for me. We need to do something to make it difficult for them to take it and use it in a negative way. And finally, and this is the one that gets interesting, is we want to make sure that the firearm is accessible for your needs. So what are your needs? Well, for everybody, it's different. If you knew that you were one of those people that just absolutely could not shoot another human being and all you wanted to fire them for was to go to the range and target practice just to shoot for scores, then it would probably be okay to take your firearm, unload it, maybe even field strip it, put a cable lock in it, throw a trigger lock on it, and put it in the safe that way, right? Yeah, because when you needed it next time, all you'd have to do is open the safe, take the trigger lock off, pull out the cable lock, all that good stuff, put it together and put some bolts in it and you're ready to shoot at the range. Not a problem accessible for your needs, but since you've got a CPL or are thinking about getting a CPL, it's probably reasonable to believe that you think you may possibly use the firearm in a self-defense situation if you needed it, right? So how can you store the firearm so that it is 
keeping it out of the hands of children, untrained adults, making theft difficult, but still accessible for your needs. Well, one of the best ways that you could do it is to get some sort of a quick open safe. Now, there's multiple different types out there. We don't recommend any particular brand, but you want something that's good that you could reach and touch in the dark. So usually one of the fingertip ones is good. So something that you could get to in the dark that you could quickly punch in the code to and that would have your safe open within a matter of just a second or two. So any of these types of safes can accomplish that. They're great for nightstands, the drawers, whatever it may be, keeping them next to the bed or, or something like that. And some of the upgraded models, they even come with a light. So uh, if it's the middle of the night and you hear that, that noise going on in your house, you go, oh, I think I got an intruder, and you reach over and you pop your safe open, the door pops open and whoa, there's your loaded firearm ready to go, all lit up for you. So um, you can get any type of these that you want, but these are usually a pretty good way to keep the firearms accessible for your needs while preventing other people from getting access to them. Now when we talked about other people getting access to your firearms, we said we want to prevent theft of firearms or make theft of firearms as difficult as possible, right? This is a subject that a lot of people don't like to talk about. Oh, the theft of their firearm. Here's one of the biggest problems that happen is people don't do anything about it preventatively. What we mean by that is that people will come home, they'll see their house has been ransacked, their gun got stolen, and they go, oh my gosh, I need my gun back. So they run down to the police station, make a police report, hey, my gun got stolen, we got to get this back before anything bad happens with it, right? Okay, the officer says, great. All right, uh, what, uh, what's the manufacturer's name? What's the make of your firearm? And you go, uh, um, I think it was a Smith & Wesson, maybe? Uh, you think it was a Smith & Wesson. Okay, all right. Okay, what caliber was it? Oh, you know, I haven't shot it in a while. Um, I, I, I think 38, maybe? I think 38. Okay, all right, all right. What was the model? Uh, I don't know. It was one of the Smith & Wesson ones. Okay, don't know the model. Okay, at least what's the serial number? Oh, I don't know. I, I never wrote that down. Okay, do you have a picture of it? Mm, no, no, no picture of it. Well, what do you want me to do with this? Well, I want you to get my firearm back. With what information? <laughs> Not very much information to go on, right? So very important that you keep a good record of your firearms. You can't rely on the dealer that you got it from to keep the records for you. You need to keep a record of your firearms so that if they're stolen, you can make an accurate report. And it's also good for your insurance purposes and for recovery. If they're able to locate that in another crime or something, a lot of times they can recover your property and get it back to you if they have the proper information. Now, if that seems like a daunting task, we've tried to make it easy on you. If you go to our website, www.safeinsight.net, visit our resources tab in the upper right-hand corner, you'll see that we have something on there called the Personal Property Firearms Log. On there, you can record as much or as little information you want about each of your firearms that you have. And you can list multiple ones on the same form. And when you hit submit, that information doesn't come to us, we don't store it anywhere, it just converts into a PDF format and gets emailed directly to you so that you now have a nice convenient PDF of all of your firearms information that you have so that if they get lost or stolen, you're able to turn it in and make an accurate report on it. Even better, if you do this from your cell phone, you're able to actually go through this very easily. You'll notice that you would start by putting the type of firearm in, there's multiple ones to choose from, you then again put as much or as little information as you want about make, model, caliber, get your serial number put in there, and then when you're ready for a picture, all you need to do is tap the little icon there, and it converts your smartphone into the camera mode. You snap a picture, and that photo gets uploaded with your PDF when you hit submit. So now, you've got a nice record of all your firearms information as well as a photo of the firearm all conveniently located at your fingertips in your email. And if you like that, we also make those available as a personal property log for other items in your home as well that you can list multiple on the same sheet. Uh, whether it's stereos, TVs, whatever it may be, you can go through and do the same exact thing and take pictures of it right on the spot. This is really helpful with jewelry so that if you need to get that recovered, it can be recovered as well. Again, visit www.safeinsight.net and go to our resources tab to look for the personal property log.
Well, since you've got a CPL, that means you're probably thinking that there's a possibility that you might have to use your firearm for self-defense, right? So it's important that you understand when you can use your firearm. To understand when you can use your firearm, you have to understand what the law says. So the Revised Code of Washington, the RCW, that deals with deadly force gives us a definition of what deadly force is before it tells us when we can use it. Here's the definition in the RCW of deadly force. It says deadly force is the intentional application of firearms or any other item reasonably likely to cause death or serious bodily harm. Now it's important to note that firearms are specifically listed as deadly force. Why do you think this is important? Because that means that any time you use your firearm, you have used deadly force. This comes into play because a lot of times people say, well, you know, I don't know if I could actually shoot somebody that came into my house. I might fire some warning shots behind them at the wall, or maybe I'll try to shoot them in the foot. Well, first off, if you've never been in an intensely stressful situation trying to shoot a firearm accurately, I can tell you that's not going to go so well for you because that doesn't work out very well. But number two, and more importantly, if you press the trigger, you fire bullets at the wall, you fire bullets into a person's foot, guess what you've just used? That's right, deadly force. So whether you killed them, whether you maimed them, or whether you shot past them, it's all the same in the type of force you've used. You have used deadly force, and you're going to be held accountable for that in court. So remember that any time you apply force with your firearm, it is deadly force. There is no such thing as warning shots. So when can you use deadly force? Well, in general, Washington state law does not allow you to use deadly force to protect any kind of property. That includes if you see somebody in your vehicle trying to prowl it. You don't get to use deadly force to stop it. You don't get to use deadly force to try to stop a minor assault. You get to use deadly force to stop and prevent the imminent threat of death or serious bodily harm to you or someone in your immediate area. So again, to reiterate, you get to use deadly force to stop an imminent threat of death or serious bodily harm to you or somebody in your immediate vicinity. This means if I'm out walking down the street, some guy comes up to me, he looks at me crooked, and I say, what are you looking at? He punches me in the nose, breaks my nose. Can I pull out my firearm and shoot him? Well, absolutely not. It's not reasonable. You probably already knew in your mind that just doesn't seem reasonable. But now we're going to explain why that's not reasonable per the law, per RCWs. Because again, the RCW says you can use deadly force, which again, remember, anytime you use your firearm, that's deadly force. You can use it to stop the imminent threat of death or serious bodily harm. Now we talked about the RCW's definition of deadly force. We all know what death is, that doesn't need to be defined. But what is serious bodily harm? Well, even though there's a definition for almost everything listed in the RCWs, unfortunately the lawmakers decided not to put a specific definition on serious bodily harm. So what does that mean? Does that mean it's up to me? If I feel like it's serious bodily harm, then game on, right? No, unfortunately that's not how it works. So once again, we come back to that example of somebody punching you in the face, breaking your nose, not serious bodily harm. And here's why. What the courts have found through a series of rulings is that typically serious bodily harm means something that is going to cause you to stay in the hospital overnight or longer. So it's not something that you would go into the ER for, get bandaged up and out. It's something that's going to cause you to be admitted and staying at the hospital for overnight or longer, typically. 
that's what would define serious bodily harm. Now, a big question that comes up for those that have a concealed pistol license is, am I required to notify law enforcement that I'm carrying a pistol if I'm contacted? Well, you're not required to in Washington State, but is it reasonable to notify the law enforcement officer? How about if we do this? Let's play a game, a little scenario game, and see what makes the most sense. So you're driving along the road, you're listening to your radio, you're having a great time, and all of a sudden you glance in your rearview mirror and, oops, you see the lights, and you hear the siren. You go, oh, man, here we go. You glance at your speedometer. Oh, 20 miles over the speed limit. This isn't going to be a good day. You pull to the side of the road. The officer walks up. How you doing, officer? Hey, good. Need to see your driver's license, proof of insurance, or registration, please. And you say, okay. Now you've got two choices. You can either notify the officer that you have a concealed pistol license and a concealed pistol on you, if that's the case. Or you can decide it's not his business. He doesn't need to know. Either choice is yours to make. But let's play the pick a path game and see kind of what happens here. Let's say you decide that you're going to go ahead and notify him. One of the best things that you can do is keep your driver's license and your concealed pistol license right next to each other. So when you pull them out, you hand both to the officer. You don't need to say anything about it. You just hand them both to him at the same time. Now, you've done two things. Number one, you've notified the officer when he sees your concealed pistol license that, hey, this person has a concealed pistol license, so they've at least been fingerprinted by the FBI. They've gone through some sort of a background check. So reasonable to believe that this person is probably a pretty good citizen. And number two, this person just gave me their concealed pistol license, notifying me that there's a good chance that they have a firearm with them right now. So it's probably reasonable to deduct that this person is not out to sneak attack and harm me today. Because what person goes, hey, just so you know, I got a concealed firearm and I'm about to attack you with it. Doesn't really happen that way, right? So it kind of helps to diffuse the situation, put the officer at ease. And so the officer may ask, you know, are you carrying one at this point or not? And you answer the questions as the officer deems necessary. That's pick a path one. Pick a path two is this officer doesn't need to know that I have a concealed pistol license and that I have firearms in the car. And let's just say you forgot that you had one in your glove compartment or you had one on your hip as you were reaching over to your glove compartment and somewhere or another either it gets exposed on your hip or it gets shown in the glove compartment, a firearm appears and the officer sees it. What's probably likely at this point? Well, there's a good chance that as you sit back up with your documents, you're going to find a firearm pointed at your head. And the officer's going to say, hey, I see that gun there. What's going on with it? Now, you obviously didn't do anything illegal, and you could say, you can't point a gun at me, but they absolutely can. It's legal because they are trying to do something for officer safety to make sure that nothing bad happens with that firearm. So, again, you've made the choice of which way you wanted to go. You decide not to notify the officer because it's none of his business. He finds the firearm. Now you've got a rough situation. Now it's going to get worked out because now you present your concealed pistol license and all that, and he now sees that you have a concealed pistol license, and you work your way through it. But it didn't have to go quite that way, right? It could have been a little smoother process. Or, let's say the other, let's say you go, oh, there's no way, there's no way he's going to see my firearm. I keep it tucked on my ankle, or I don't, you know, whatever the case may be. He's not going to find that firearm. And he doesn't need to know that I've got a concealed pistol license, that I have a firearm, so it's my legal right, doesn't need to know. Okay, great. So, let's say you give him your driver's license, registration, and insurance, he goes back to his vehicle, and what's he doing back there? Well, he's running you through the computer. That's what's going on. When he runs your license, guess what pops up? Oh, yeah your CPL shows up because it's attached to your license in the Department of Licensing Records. So that officer is going to instantly know that you've got a CPL. So you're not hiding anything by not notifying the officer. All you're doing is potentially creating issues. So by just giving the officer the information up front, it helps to diffuse the situation, keep it very smooth, 
and just keep you from having additional problems. But again, in Washington State, you are not required to notify an officer that you have a concealed pistol license or a firearm on you. It's your choice. So now you've got your concealed pistol license. Now you can carry your pistol anywhere in the state of Washington you so desire, right? Wrong. <laughs> There are places that are off limits and prohibited to carry a firearm in Washington. And the first thing we're going to tell you is that much like with firearm safety, the laws are your responsibility to know. So it's up to you to make sure that you know where you can and cannot carry a firearm in the state of Washington. What we are going to do now is tell you a few places that are common that you need to know right up front you absolutely cannot carry in the state of Washington. The first one is courthouses. You cannot carry in courthouses in Washington State. The next one is in establishments that are drinking locations for those 21 and over. Those are often referred to as bars or bar areas. But this one gets a little bit confusing for people sometimes because they go, well, I, I don't understand. So I can't carry my firearm into the bar, but I but I want to go into the restaurant. My favorite restaurant has a kid's area, but they've got a bar in it, so I can't bring my firearm in there? Well, here's what it means. It means basically any area that you would enter that you would have to show ID to prove that you're 21 or over for drinking purposes, you cannot bring a firearm in there. That means if your favorite happy hour spot, the bar down the street or the pub down the road from your work, if they require you to be 21 to enter the building, then you cannot bring the firearm into that building. But on the flip side, if you go to Red Robin or your other favorite restaurant and they have a family section and then they've got a designated bar area, you can carry your concealed pistol, excuse me, you can carry your concealed pistol anywhere in the regular family area, anywhere where children are able to be seated. But you cannot legally bring your concealed pistol into the bar area where you would have to be 21 years or older to enter. The next one is schools. In Washington schools, you cannot carry a concealed pistol on school grounds. This one throws people off a little bit because they go, well, wait a minute, I want to drop my child off or pick them up, but I can't have my firearm with me when I do that? Well, what it means is that you cannot walk on school grounds with a concealed pistol on. If you stay in your vehicle, the courts have recognized that your vehicle is your property. It doesn't matter if you're driving on school grounds as long as you stay in your vehicle. If you choose to exit your vehicle to say walk your child to the classroom or go pick them up or go see the principal, you need to remove your pistol from your person, store it securely somewhere in your vehicle. And you can park on school grounds in your vehicle with that firearm secured somewhere, it needs to be secured, but the vehicle is your property. And so even though it's parked on school grounds, the pistol has remained in your property. So you are legal to do that. It's just important to note that if you choose to get out of the vehicle, you cannot have your pistol with you then. Finally, the interesting one, private businesses. Can you carry a concealed pistol into a business that has a little sign on the door that says, no firearms permitted or no firearms here or something to that effect? Well, since we're in Washington State, let's take one of the Northwest favorites, Starbucks. Starbucks used to let people carry into the Starbucks locations, no problem. But there were sadly a few groups of people that tried to push the envelope, tried to take it a little too far, and Starbucks ended up backing off and saying, hey, we don't want firearms in our locations any longer. Please don't bring firearms into our stores. Some of them have signs posted that say no firearms in this location or something to that effect. So, can you carry your concealed pistol into the Starbucks? Well, again, let's take the scenario. Let's say you walk into Starbucks. You've got your concealed pistol on. You step up and you say, hmm, I think I'll have my drink today, my triple soy latte, no fat, 180 degrees, hold the whipped cream, and maybe add a splash of hazelnut on there. Please triple cup that, or something to that effect. And in the process, your shirt gradually gets caught up on your pistol, and your pistol gets exposed. Well, first off, you're probably going to get a reaction similar to this. Ah, he's got a gun! <laughs> and that's okay. And your reaction will be, oh, yes, I do. Whoops tuck it back in. What's going to happen? 
Well, now the employee is probably going to say, "Sir, we don't allow firearms here. We'd like you to leave." At which point you can either say, "Understood. Sorry about that. Didn't mean to do that. I'll exit now." And uh, you know, maybe you'll take it off, put it in the car, or come back in, whatever you want. But you go with the program and leave because they asked you to. Or number two, you can take what's behind door number two, stand your ground and say. I'm a U.S. citizen. It's my Second Amendment right to carry. I will carry in this location if I want to. You cannot stop me. At which point, now they get to make a decision, and the decision usually consists of something like this: Hmm, which one of you guys is going to dial nine one one? And somebody dials nine one one, says, "Ah,、uh, yeah, we've asked the customer to leave. They refuse to leave. We'd like you to make them leave, please." Now you are going to leave. And this time, you're going to have friends to leave with. You're going to have at least one police officer, maybe two or three, depending on how belligerent you've decided to get about the situation. And as a parting gift, you're going to get some nice silver bracelets on your wrist to take with you. And if you're lucky, you'll get a warm lunch in the county jail because guess what? You just got arrested. But did you get arrested for carrying a firearm into Starbucks? No. The firearm never came into play in you getting arrested. What happened is you got arrested for trespassing, because Starbucks and any other private business reserves the right to refuse service to anybody that they don't want in their location. They asked you to leave. You refuse to leave. You are now trespassing. So while your firearm may have caught the attention and made them want you to leave. Your firearm did not get you in trouble. It was your refusal to leave that got you in trouble. That's why you were arrested for trespassing. The point behind this long-winded scenario is that in Washington State, signs do not have the force of law. In other states, such as Oregon, a private business can put up a little sign in their window that says "No guns allowed here," and that actually has the force of law. You can be arrested for walking in that location. But in Washington State, signs by themselves do not have the force of law. The only signs that have the force of law are those that say, such as entering into a bar, that say something to the effect of "firearms are prohibited per RCW blah 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 blah." If they quote the RCW that prohibits it in that location, that means it's prohibited. If it's just a general sign that you could order off Amazon or somewhere else that says "no guns allowed." That does not have the weight of law. It just means they don't want them there. So again, in Washington State, private businesses have the right to ask you not to bring firearms into their location. They have the right to ask you to leave if you do so, but you cannot get arrested for bringing one into their location. We hope you found this information valuable and useful as you begin your journey as a CPL holder. If you are interested in further training opportunities, feel free to get a hold of us at www.safeinsight.net and check out some of the training we offer, including marksmanship training, multi-state CCW classes. We also offer knife training, women's self-defense, and children's self-defense. So, if you need any training, please feel free to get a hold of us at www.safeinsight.net or stop by one of our training locations, and we'll be happy to help you. We hope that you have. A safe experience as a CPL holder.